Welcome back, everybody. <laughs> Folks, my next guest is the former Secretary of Energy, CEO of the Nuclear Threat Initiative, and president of the Energy Futures Initiative. Please welcome back to The Late Show, Secretary Ernest Moniz. Thanks for being here. Um, Thank you. Well, I, I don't know if you saw what I was saying to Lewis a little bit earlier, is that um, there's been so much talk lately about the possibility that Putin might fire off what has called uh, a tactical nuclear weapon or a battlefield nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. And um, it just seems to me that not enough attention is being paid to the idea of what tactical means versus strategic. And... Uh, I, I was hoping you could define that for us because I feel like this whole subject is just being softened up for us in ways that is just not healthy. Mm -hmm. We're sort of, it's reducing our resistance to the idea that nuclear weapons would be used by talking about it in these kind of soft terms like tactical or battlefield. What is a tactical nuke? Yeah, maybe it's best to uh, give you a reference point first. Okay. Uh, the bomb that exploded in Hiroshima. Mm -hmm. uh, it was about 15,000 tons TNT equivalent, 15 kilotons. Uh, somewhat arbitrary definition, tactical nuclear weapons, one-third that size or less. Mm -hmm. um, it could be a factor of 10 less, could be even a bit more. But to give you a standard on the other side, mm -hmm. if you go back to the Oklahoma City bombing of mm -hmm. some years ago and the destruction that caused, that was, of course, not a nuclear weapon. That was a fertilizer bomb, basically. Mm -hmm. So no, no radiation. Mm -hmm. But that was two tons. So 10,000 times less than Hiroshima. So it gives you a scale. A small nuclear weapon ain't all that small. I mean, it's uh, still a pretty bad day. Right, it seems uh, to me like right. the difference is between uh, the worst thing you could think of and the unthinkable. Like, that's the scale. You know, the worst thing yeah. you can imagine and unimaginably horrible. What, why do tactical nuclear weapons exist? So they were introduced uh, by the United States and the Soviet Union, uh, as you said, uh, as something that could be viably used in a battlefield. Uh, so you would literally use them against troop concentrations or supply lines and the like. The United States has gotten rid of most of its uh, uh, tactical uh, nuclear weapons. The Soviet Union is not. They've got about 2,000 of them. And uh, Putin's nuclear saber rattling is certainly very unsettling, to put it mildly. But, you know, he's already crossed the line, even without using the nuclear weapon, as he is essentially threatened to do many times. And the reason is that, you know, the United States and the Soviet Union always took a, what I would say, responsible position, understanding that we had these huge arsenals and that we had to be very careful about managing them. And we had them just to prevent the other side from attacking us. Right, deterrence yeah. associated deterrence, with the, right, the policy yeah, of mutual right. deter destruction. Whereas Putin now has used it as a coercive tool to invade a non-nuclear weapon state. It's a fundamental change. A nuclear, a non-nuclear weapon state Ukraine. specifically gave their nukes to Russia yeah. when the, the, the Russian Soviet, Federation broke Soviet up. Soviet nuclear weapons returned, yes. returned to Russia, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I would uh, note that the many, many countries that do not have nuclear weapons uh, certainly pay attention to this because the fear has always been that until the nuclear weapons states got rid of their nuclear weapons, they could be used exactly that way as tools of coercion. So, so one taboo has been broken, but the big taboo against using a nuclear weapon, we hope will hold, uh, uh, obviously, despite the threats. Well, today we learned that Russian military leaders discussed the use of tactical nukes. We have intelligence saying that and that the, the upshot of this, this intel that they have is that these Russian generals believe that Putin is serious about this, even though he has said, no, I would never do that. Yeah, that, that military leaders are discussing that is not new. That's been for decades. Uh, but what is new is doing it in the context of the president, who has the sole authority to use those weapons, having threatened to use them. And, Did you uh, think we would be here because we, we both grew up with the, the looming threat of a, a strategic, strategic exchange of ICBMs and the idea that it's all going to be over tomorrow, 
That was an ongoing like nightmare of my childhood. But I all let, I let that go in the mid '90s. Did you imagine we'd be here having a a a, a reasonable subject for discussion? Is what we're talking about right now. Well, first of all, you're referring back to the duck and cover days. Uh, exactly. Under the school desk. Right, the school desk uh, will right, save all of us. Right. Do we just need uh, to distribute and, school desks and, again? Uh, absolutely, and uh, but but really thick ones. Yes. Uh, and uh, and and I and I would suggest as well that I think one is seeing a revival of building bomb shelters in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're kind of going back to that time. But your question, look, the Cold War ended early '90s. Uh, there was a kind of like a collective exhale. Well, we got past that. The trouble is that there are some new threats, uh, like cyber attacks. Suppose there's a cyber, successful cyber attack on the nuclear weapons command system, command and control system. Mm -hmm. um, what we're worried about is blunder, that nobody means to use the nuclear we weapons in a major exchange, but that there's a blunder. Somebody hacks in. Uh, initiates uh, a series of events where, you know, presidents only have minutes to make a decision uh, in terms of what to do. So we're worried about that, which is why we think we have to keep on with lowering the number of weapons, eventually get rid of them, and satisfy our non-proliferation goals. Who can talk to Putin? So um, we think that who, who can talk to Putin successfully, I mean, many people can talk with Putin, but successfully, yeah, I think you have to start by looking at who does he, who does Russia need on his side? Needs China, needs India. They're buying the oil right now from, uh, from Russia. Uh, maybe you can argue Saudi Arabia and OPEC for the oil markets, you know, et cetera. So the leaders of those countries, and most especially China, uh, could have real sway. And we have argued that if Putin were to use a nuclear weapon in Ukraine, it would be very bad for China's self-interest because that could lead in uncontrolled ways to their own security environment unraveling. You know, they live in a neighborhood where Japan and South Korea and Taiwan, frankly, all have significant nuclear capabilities. And if they decided that, you know, they had to move towards nuclear weapons, they certainly have the technical capability to do so. So we think China has a self-interest and President Xi should be talking to his declared friend, uh, don't cross that line. Thank you for such a cheerful conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Secretary Ernest Moniz, everybody. We'll be right back.